you know, we also tried to make the script our own and, and, and distinguish it from the book a bit by uh, leaning into different stylistic choices. You know, we use narrative techniques that would really help to reflect Cherry's shifting perspective of the world as he travels through his journey. And Anthony and Joe really inspired us to do that and to make bold choices when we were doing that. And so, you know, we started playing with genre and tone and rhythm, and um, we tried to represent people and things exactly as Cherry might imagine them or as he actually sees them. Um, we yep. really wanted to create a character who felt incredibly nuanced and specific, but also incredibly relatable too, you know, as if he could feel like anyone in, um, to us, he, he certainly feels emblematic of a generation, you know, obviously one that's facing an extraordinary crisis right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I gotta tell you, Tiho, I, there was times watching this with me and my missus and we're just like, you're literally unrecognizable as the person that we know. And I think it's really interesting. I mean, and Sierra, Sierra, you should know this too, obviously, right? We, why are we always surprised that what we do for a living can actually translate even to people who know us where they say like, oh yeah, you, you wore this mask and portrayed this character. And I, I really got lost in it with you. You completely suspended my disbelief. But again, the nature of this kind of movie, it could become episodic. So I want to throw it back to the brothers because I think what, what, what helped frame the, the narrative and helped, I think, support the stars was this kind of changing degrees and dimensions. So you felt like you kept going into these different wormholes of perspective. And, and where did that uh, approach come from? It certainly worked. I wonder why and how it occurred to you brothers to uh, enforce it that way, to, to build it up into that kind of machinery. I was really trying to honor the, you know, the, the subjectivity of the book, right? And we wanted to infuse, this is a character who has tremendous and intense life experience over 15 years. He falls in love at a young age. He makes a decision that he doesn't have the life experience to make, i.e. signing up for military service. You know, he becomes part of the military. But we wanted each chapter of his experience, wanted the audience to feel it as much as possible. So we're using every cinematic technique that we could to define each of those experiences as being different from one another. Because if you, again, track this journey, the first chapter of the movie is magical realism. He's falling in love. We're using soft lenses. We're using um, muted colors. We're trying to create this feeling of what it, you know, remind people what it's like before you become jaded and, and, and you, know, you can find that person that, that you believe is going to be the person that's going to be with you for the rest of your life. Then he moves into... Uh, um, boot camp, and the aspect ratio of the film actually shifts on you. It closes in because the walls are starting to close in on the character. We shoot that entire sequence because he has this intellectual relationship with the training that approaches absurdism, and that's how he feels about it. So everything is shot through the same wide distorted lens. Every shot in those nine minutes is shot with one single lens, and it does distort reality. Some of that distortion is then carried into the war where that absurdism slowly gives way uh, from detachment and irony into psychological horror. And things happen to him that he's not prepared for uh, and which carries into the PTSD section where we start framing him off center. We're using non-complementary uh, uh, coverage, I, meaning you know Tom will be sitting in the theater, shoves way to the left of the frame, and then we'll cut to a very yeah. diminished shot of Sierra, you know, barely peeking past him because his perspective is shifting. He's now starting to use drugs and alcohol to sedate himself and to escape these horrors. And we want you to feel that, what it feels like, that, that, that um, deconstruction of your, your, your intellect. Uh, we wanted you to feel that through the techniques that we employed. And then, it, you know, it goes into a sort of numbing, ironic section of the film where you know he, he's now using drugs full time for self medication and he's robbing banks uh, to pay for the habit and then lastly into this lyricism um uh in incarceration and you'll notice that the camera moves uh from right to left telling a story during that incarceration 
And the moment that, you know, she refers to earlier in the film is one day this will all stop and it'll go quiet. He has that epiphany yeah. while sitting in the prison yard. And then the camera actually reverses direction on the story now because he's finally yeah. heading in the right direction. It takes us to the end of the movie, this gorgeous moment with the two of them at the end where you feel all the pain that these two people feel for having lost that decade and a half of their lives to two poor decisions that they made as children. And that's the you know, tragedy they, of the movie for us. So this is a modern love story. Right. Well, and also uh, I will say, um, Sierra and Tom, the more down and dirty y'all got and the more naturalistic it became, almost documentary, the, the less complimentary things got, the more real I felt and the more strangely beautiful it was in a way. So I, I found it was just such a, that, that part when, when it's all going downhill before he goes to the Huskow and particularly um, just some of those, those images of desperation. But I want to say, Anthony, I want to get down to the reality here, right? Many of us have been used to budgetless movies, by which I mean there's no amount that's too much to spend because we're in that sweet spot. I don't know how you got this movie done in the time frame. I remember Tom telling me, and so Sierra, I'm sure it was the same for you. I mean, this must have been an insaniac schedule, but the team that you assembled, the, the crafts, I mean, from uh, Jeff Groth, Thomas Newton Siegel, Phil Ivey, Henry Jackman, um, Anthony, can you speak a little bit to how you got this long bench of talent to come and basically just grind it out and do the exact opposite of everything many of us had become accustomed to? Yeah, it, you know, look, it's a great question. You know, Joe and I started off as independent filmmakers making no budget movies. So it's that that um, approach to storytelling is very familiar to us. And uh, even at this point in our career is nostalgic to us. So we were happy to uh, revisit it on this movie. But um, yeah, we've been very fortunate, uh, like everybody here on this call, we, we've been able to um, work with remarkable people throughout our careers. And we were able to assemble a, an amazing group of those people for this movie. There's no way a, a movie like this can be made um, without... A, a collaborative team, you know, Joe and I, you know this very well, Robert, it's, you know, Joe and I work as a team. We love the process of collaboration and it's that, that interaction that we have with all of our creative collaborators is how we find the movie. And um, it's very elemental to our process. I think also we had an added layer it, with this movie in particular, in the sense that because the opioid crisis is an ongoing crisis, because PTSD is an ongoing crisis, because these are difficult issues for people to talk about, you know, when you were suffering from these issues, it's, you don't normally bring them up. When you're a loved one of somebody suffering with these issues, you aren't talking about them. It almost it can, can often feel like a dirty secret that you're locked up about. And a movie, I think, can provide a, sort of a lifeline to people who are struggling internally with these issues that says, you know what, you're not alone, you're not isolated, it's not a dirty secret that you, it's, it's, it's a part of life and it can be, I think, lead to a release and perhaps hopefully a road forward for some people. So I think everybody who came together to make this movie also recognized that there was a level of importance to, to telling a story like this and that it was also very timely um, because of the ongoing crisis. So, you know, I think it was a nice confluence of, 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 of events that brought this group together to make this movie at this particular moment. Well, it's, it's also never a bad idea to go and see how can you tell even more story at smaller scale and foregoing all of those comforts that we're used to. But I just want to say, honestly, the, the, the writing is so critical. And I, you know, it's the hardest part. And, and I really feel Jessica and Angela just did a bang up job, stellar performances. Uh, Rooster Brothers, I'm used to you guys. So it's like, if it hadn't been great, I would have been like, what happened? Were they replaced? Um, uh, Tom, I, I wanted to ask you too, because you get to play an addict. I, I, I never got called, by the way, to be your, your special uh, counsel. So um, addict, a soldier, and a criminal, which one of those was the most difficult for you to access? Um, 
I think physically and mentally, uh, playing the addict day in and day out was really taxing. Um, as you'll know, I, I like to leave my work at work. I don't like to bring it home with me. It means that when you say cut, I've be become Tom Holland again and I don't stay in it in that way. So what I found really difficult was the first thing every morning, kind of getting back into that mental headspace and knowing that the next 10 hours of my life was going to be really difficult and I was going to have to push myself. And, and you know, I was starving myself and, and I was screaming and crying and 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 kicking walls and punching stuff. And, and it was just one of those things where I just had to dive in. I just had to dive in and, and bless the Russos. I mean, they were so supportive throughout the whole process and I needed that. I really needed someone to kind of guide me through it and help me make the right decisions and know when to push myself and know when to pull back. Um, we were talking earlier, you know, we're colleagues, but we're friends first. And it was a really interesting thing to see where I would be pushing myself or I would have hurt myself and they would kind of come in and be like, oh, we, we don't really want to tell you to do that again because we hate seeing you like that. But it's really good. So if you wouldn't mind doing it again, that would be great. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, no, I, we're all familiar with that aspect of the brothers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Sierra, you I, matched I just, them. I mean, moment for moment, you guys are so down the rabbit hole together that just as a performer, I'm going, this is like doing eight shows a week, eight times a day. It's just bananas. Um, we have a... Uh, a question from one of our guild members. I love the use of color, as did I, uh, and how it plays a role in transitions from one scene to another. Tell us about the decision to do that. We, Ant Antonioni was a, um, a, a, a big influence on us. Red Desert was a huge influence on us. And that, that's a movie that uses color to express uh, uh, interior life, emotional intensity. Uh, and that was a... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a directive that we gave to the team was, listen, we want to use color to uh, convey uh, the different states of mind for this character as the movie progresses. So the palette is very specific uh, regarding, again, each chapter of the movie. Each chapter had its own color palette ascribed to it. Obviously, you know, we can't just make a film that's, that's six different, um, completely different sequences. There has to be a unification. And that was the hardest part, I think, was to find ways to both demarcate but unify uh, at, at the same time. And uh, that color and music are, are elements that you can use to, you know, pull the audience through uh, um, something as, um, as uh, experimental as this. I, I would say, you know, the color was an extension of our commitment to the subjectivity of the experience that Terry was going through in the film. Um, you know, it was very much, we really wanted to find a, 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 as wide a variety of cinematic techniques as we could to relay this concept that this reality and this experience is being filtered through this very specific perspective of this character. And, and, and color, was, co color was elemental to that, as, as were a number of other things. And it was kind of interesting to us as well that part of the uh, dimension of the character was that he was colorblind, which comes out in his uh, medical right. exam when he's, when he's uh, yeah, tr entering That's the right. army at basic training. Yeah. And, and by the way, I just had to say that I loved when you're doing that kind of like boogaloo flag dance. Uh, by the end of it, it shows that you, you've basically been driven mad, and that's not even the toughest part of the story. I want to try to do a few speed rounds on these last few because they're such interesting questions. In the adaptation process, was the humor already in there regarding the names of the banks? I love that. And also the anonymity of the protagonist. The anonymity of the protagonist is from the book. Um, it's referred to as the narrator in the book. We call the character Cherry in, in the screenplay. Um, yep. We came up with the names for the banks. We figured that is exactly as Cherry would perceived the banks at that point in his journey. So we, we had some fun coming up it's with a, that. It's a little bit Mr. Robot, too, in there, which I just kind of dug. It is definitely a little uh, glitch in the matrix. Here's one. I was in Iraq in 2005 and 2006 in the Triangle of Death, and those scenes were excellent and realistic. 
I am now in the WGA. Welcome. Wow. Well, the, How did welcome you and yes, get such beautiful. realism? That that was really critical to us as well, that the the battle sequences be as authentic as possible so that, again, there have been a lot of movies about war. And, you know, you can, as a filmmaker, choose to tell war either expressionistically or realistically. Our choice here was realism because we wanted you to feel the, as I said before, that tr the trauma implant on, on Cherry as a character. Uh, we had an incredible uh, um, military advisor named Brian McHugh, who uh, has had a, a long uh, career uh, in the military, uh, and he meticulously planned every one of those sequences um, based on battles that he had been in at previous points uh, in his life, either in Iraq or elsewhere. Uh, and he would go from extra to extra and talk them through what they would be doing, how they would be feeling, you know, what how, what what you know rate heart rate they would have, whether they'd be sweating, whether they could could keep their composure or not keep their composure. So the scenes were all very meticulously arranged by uh, by Brian, and he did an incredible job. And you know, our, our commitment uh, to realism in that sequence was uh, was backed up by this idea that like Cherry, you know, Cherry begins the movie with a little bit of a disconnect to his environment, and that sort of increases as the story goes on. Um, but the one moment, it's probably the most naturalistic sequence in the film is the sequence in Iraq because the threat or life of, uh, of, of, of death takes away any disconnection to the events that are unfolding around you. There's nothing that focuses you like that. So we felt it was very appropriate for that section of the movie to be very specific and realistic, uh, much more so than, than the rest of the film. Um, there's a, a few scenes. Uh, this is always a really tough one, is breaking the fourth wall. Um, Tom, what was that uh, experience like for you? I, I mean, you know, you're right down the barrel, and it's like it's just a different kind of nakedness and exposure. What was your process with that? It was really difficult, actually. I mean, you spend your entire career trying to not look at the camera, and then all of a sudden that isn't necessarily the rule anymore. And the thing I found really complicated is whenever Cherry addresses the camera, it is his present self reminiscing about what is going on in that moment. So it was hard to try and find a way to bounce between the, the two versions of him, the one reminiscing and the one him living in the present. Um, so that's, it's just one of those things that took a while for me to get used to. But there's, there's moments, I, I love those moments because I know how difficult they were for me to try and get right. Um, but it's just one of those things that I just had to get on with and, and trust the bros that I was that they were happy and I was doing the right thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, it wasn't the easiest thing for me to try and achieve. Watching Tom, watching Tom do what he's just describing there, where he was able to slip in in and out of two different versions of the character that were separated yeah. by years and years of his life and miles of experience so dexterously, like in and out and in and out. I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen on a performance level, so difficult to do. Uh, and I, you know, watching him work himself into the place where he could do that in the blink of an eye was, 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 uh, was amazing. They shredded themselves physically and emotionally for this. I just want to bring up that, you know, I think Tom lost almost a quarter of his body weight. I know Sierra lost a lot of weight. And you know what it's like when you do that for a role and you're living with that every day and you're starving yourself and you're having to uh, go to work and deal with these emotionally fraught scenes. These two yeah. really shredded themselves. And, you know, kudos to you guys and bravo because you laid yourselves bare, you laid yourselves raw for these performances to get as much authenticity as possible out of it. it as Ann said, it's, it was uh, some of the most impressive performance work that we've ever uh, been a part of. And um, it, it came at a real physical cost to both of them. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, we almost had a broken ankle, a broken nose, just a lot of um, uh, uh, emotional, physical work for these two. Great. I'll go to one of the last uh, statements here. Truly amazing performances. Sierra is a revelation. Love the direction and cinematography. Tom's best work. 
Uh, can Jessica and Angela please tell us a bit to wrap up on how they collaborated on the writing process for this masterful screenplay? Thank you. Um, well, like I said, the first step was Angela took me to Cleveland and we, you know, we literally walked through the city. We walked through the bank robberies. We walked down the streets that are in the movie. Um, we talked a lot about how to focus it. Um, and then there was, what would you say happened next? Just, a, you know, one of the most interesting parts about the process for me that I had never experienced was... Um, the way the Russo brothers develop a movie, they they read it out loud. Um, so it, it's almost like working on a play, which was a, a beautiful new experience for me and, and really helps you deeply delve into the material. But um, how else, what yeah. else would you say? Ange? That's my favorite part of it as well, is you know, with doing the, the table reads together, just constantly refining. I mean, we, we worked on the script straight through production so much of Emily's character grew during production and because of Sierra's performance and what she was bringing. So we were finding pieces of that, very significant pieces of that through production. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, it, was a, it, was a, it was just a lot of, you know, striving to make it better and better, but very collaborative and obviously always under Anthony and Joe's leadership and really building ideas with that team that you brought up before, Robert which was a dream come true. I mean, that was a pretty meaningful um, experience for me. It was really inspired work to, to work with each of those creatives. Yeah, well, it, it's just wild. So fellow Guild members, I hope you enjoyed this Q&A as much as I did. I feel like it really, I, honestly, I just got to say, this is one of those movies, Tom, fellas, ladies, that you're going to wind up when it comes on in five years, wherever it is in the movie, you're going to want to watch it. It's the highest compliment I can pay to a piece of cinema is it bears rewatching. It's one of those things that really is a meditation. And, and the fact that all of you infused it with something that has such meaning in this crisis, within the crisis, within the crisis. And again, God bless our troops and what they go through. And, and honestly, the redemption that happens at the end. I just want to put it back to where all credit ultimately belongs with the actors. What, um, kidding, Sierra and, and, and Brother Tom, what you were able to do with that moment at the end, once they gone through that last part where you are, and she has, if not forgiven you, she is still there for you. It is such a, it could have been cheesy, but without that uplift, I wouldn't have been ready for that lesson. And again, the, just the honesty with which you two portrayed it was just fantastic. So I want to thank you all. Uh, I think we all learned a little something about ourselves and certainly about the movie to watch this season, Cherry. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Robert. Thank you very much. You. This yeah. was really so lovely. Guys, thank you. It really was. Say, thank you for doing this. Your, your perspective, yeah. Robert, helps, helps us learn something about the movie as well. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Sure, sure. Come on. Undoubtedly.